manner of death. And now we're going to take a look at cause versus mechanism. So the cause of death is the reason for the death. Okay? It's the actual cause of death within the body. So was it a heart attack? Was it a shooting? Okay? Then there's the mechanism, and that's the specific change in the body that's brought about by the cessation of life. Okay? That's the mechanism of death. So the cause may have been a shooting or a stabbing, but the mechanism is the loss of blood. Okay? Somebody, the cause may have been a heart attack, but the mechanism is pulmonary arrest. Okay? What's actually physiologically going on in the body that causes the person to have that irreversible cessation of um, the circulatory system. So, what are factors that then are used to approximate the time of death. And this is where it gets interesting because we learned a little bit about this in the case studies video. Um, liver mortis um, is one of the things that um, a coroner or an on-site detective is going to look for. Um, this individual, this body here, is obviously um, fully into liver mortis. Um, it's given that name because the word liver refers to black and blue markings. Um, it's usually uh, a malice or chastisement or punishment. Um, it can be signs, you know, because of the bruising that's caused by that type of crime. Mortis is upon death. So we start to see the changes in color upon death. So liver mortis um, is known as the leaden color of death. It's when red blood cells break down, they turn a bluish purple color. So with decomposition occurring, the blood actually seeps down and settles into the lower parts of the body. So wherever the body's position determines what those lower parts are actually going to be. That pooling of blood that we see is called lividity. Um, now, warmth, higher temperatures actually accelerate this process. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, that, that we have to keep in mind when we're studying liver mortis um, in terms of trying to approximate the time of death. So I want you to think about if somebody were stashed in a closet okay, after they were killed, where would that lividity occur? It's probably going to occur in the lower legs, right, and in the feet. So you find a body that's laying flat in a dumpster, like on the back, but yet there's lividity in the lower legs and feet. What does that tell you? Well, it should indicate that the body had been moved, that that's not the original position it was in when the person died. Now, liver mortis begins two hours after death. And then there's kind of a blanching that occurs for up to eight hours. And that's where we notice that the body becomes white. Um, after eight hours, it becomes fixed. So dual lividity can be seen if the body is moved during that period of time. So within that first eight hours, if the person was moved out of that closet and into the dumpster, we would see lividity in both the lower legs and along the back. Okay. Now the color, if there's a difference in the coloring of that um, liver mortis, it can indicate carbon monoxide poisoning. Now. We've also studied, or heard, I'm sorry, we've heard about rigor mortis. And rigor is referred to as stiffness or hardness, and mortis is referred to as death. So this is the stiffening of the body that occurs upon death. So let's see how this works. At death, basically the skeletal muscles cannot relax. Without oxygen, calcium accumulates in these muscles. And then the muscles become really stiff. So if you've studied anatomy, you know that the release of calcium ions is what causes the contraction um, in, in the muscle fibers. This usually happens between, um, well, it starts between two and six hours of death. And it usually starts with really small muscles first and then goes to the largest. So you're going to see it first in things like the eyelids, the neck, and the jaw. And then it goes to those larger muscles, like your leg muscles. After about 15 hours, the muscle fibers then begin to dissolve and softening begins. Okay, so remember, if you've studied muscle contraction before, we know that 
there's the myelin or myosin and the actin. And it's the myosin and actin fibers that are actually contracting and it's because of those release of calcium ions. Now, there are some factors that are going to affect rigor mortis. The ambient temperature, meaning the air temperature where the body is. If it's really cold, if it's really hot, is going to affect how quickly this occurs. The person's weight is going to be a factor as well. Somebody much larger um, and obese is going to have a much slower progression of rigor mortis compared to somebody that's really small and thin. Um, the type of clothing that they're wearing, how restrictive it is, could affect rigor mortis too because that's going to determine um, how well the ambient temperature is a factor. If the person was ill, can also affect rigor mortis. Oh, excuse me. Oh, dad. Oh. There's the physical activity that occurs shortly before death. If somebody was super active, had they been running away um, from the perpetrator, then they probably are going to have rigor mortis set in in those areas faster than had they not been physically active. Also, sun exposure. So we're going to be looking at rigor mortis, and I want you to view page 315 in the textbooks that are in the classroom um, and look at figure 11.9. So if you would do me a favor and jot that down, that would be awesome. So sorry, my husband just got home. That's why the dog was all excited, and you're probably going to hear him trotting around the house here. Um, so rigor mortis, the muscles actually relax after 24 to 48 hours. Um, and so they usually occur, it occurs in the same order as it began. So again, those smaller muscles are going to relax and soften first. So the eyelids, the neck, the jaw, and then slowly, gradually moving on to those larger muscles like those in the legs. Many infant and child corpses um, actually don't even exhibit perceptible rigor. Um, and this decreases um, the perceptible stiffness because their, their muscles are so much smaller that it's hard to tell that they're actually going through rigor, rigor mortis. All right, so when we look at these times, um, you've got a table um, in your packet. And so when rigor begins, again, this is somewhere between two to six hours after the person dies, um, the body begins to stiffen, and that occurs usually in the face and then works its way down the body. At about 12 hours, um, that's where rigor is complete. So we we see peak rigor. The entire body is actually rigid at that point. And then between 15 and 36 hours, again, depending on those factors that we talked about, there's a slow loss of rigor. Smaller muscles first, then larger muscles. And if the body is completely soft and rigor has completely disappeared, um, that means that the body becomes flaccid and very flexible again. And that's somewhere between 36 and 48 hours. Okay, so rigor mortis is something that we can use because we know this timeline to determine time of death. Algor mortis um, is referred to as cold upon death. And so this is going to be the change in the body temperature. Typically, um, this is when the coroner would insert, insert a thermometer into the liver. And that's where they actually take the temperature. The body cools at approximately 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit per hour, and that occurs in the first 12 hours after death. So we can do a calculation to actually determine, um, based upon the liver temperature, how long prior to that point in time was the body um, ceasing life. So after that 12 hours, starting with hour 13, it actually, the process slows down. So it slows down to 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit per hour until it reaches room temperature or ambient temperature. So the factors that are going to affect algor mortis are going to be the ambient temperature. Again, if it's really hot, we're not going to see a decrease in that body temperature. If it's really cold, it's actually probably going to occur a lot faster. Um, if the person is obese and has a lot of body fat, then that this process takes longer as well. And again, the type of clothing. If somebody's in a full-on snowmobile suit, it's going to take a lot longer for the body temperature to cool down. So the approximate times um, when we're filling in this table, we're looking at um, 
when the person has not been dead more than three hours, the body is still warm, very, very close to actual body temperature. Um, they still feel lukewarm between three and eight hours, um, but they're going to start to feel cold after that eight-hour mark. So anywhere from eight to 36 hours, they're going to feel cold, and they're going to be even colder than um, more than 36 hours past. Now, something else that we can look at during an autopsy are the stomach and intestinal contents. And this is going to take anywhere from four to six hours for the stomach to empty its contents. So we can look at when was the last time the person ate, what did they eat. It takes 12 hours for the food to leave the small intestine. So depending on when they died, if it was within four to six hours, we're only going to see food in the stomach. If it's up to 12 hours later, we're going to see food that has moved into the small intestine. And then it takes 24 hours until all undigested food is actually released from the large intestine. So it can take up to a whole day before that food has been eliminated. So basically what we see is between zero and two hours after the last meal, the undigested stomach contents would be present. Between four and six hours after the last meal, we'll find it in the small intestine. And then between 12 and 24 hours, we'll find it in the large intestine. So that's one way, that, that's another way, sorry, that we can um, use stomach and intestinal contents. Then we look at eye changes, and that can be any anyway. weight film can be observed on the surface of the eye if it's open at death. Um, it would be 24 hours later if the eye is actually closed. And then <clears throat> investigators are also probably going to do some <clears throat> investigating, just, you know, asking people questions. When was this individual last sighted? When was the last time they got their newspaper at their house or their mail? When was the last time they clocked out at their job? And we saw examples of that, or clocked in for that matter. Um, we saw an example of that in our case studies as well. So that's where we're going to stop for today.